All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and, and get this thing started. Uh, we see uh, people are still uh, coming in at this point, so we'll try our best to uh, keep everybody up to date as we're going here. Uh, but uh, seeing people from all over the country, which is always a lot of fun, uh, seeing where everybody's coming from. Uh, and it's about something that's really, really important to us, uh, which is onboarding. And, and part of what we do at Wrenchway is uh, really kind of promoting and improving the industry in, in any way that we can, right? And I think one of the major issues we see as an industry, and we hear it from technicians every day, is maybe the lack of process when it comes to onboarding or the lack of ability to do uh, a good onboarding uh, in general with a lot of these folks. And we actually did a Wrenchway Insiders poll that said 92% uh, of technicians replied uh, saying that their shop's onboarding process was average at best, with over half rating the process as below average or worse. So this is obviously an issue. And so I'm joined by uh, three people today that I very much respect in the industry and three people that I think can bring a lot to this conversation. So I want to uh, take a minute to introduce the three of them and then we'll go through some general housekeeping and dive right into the onboarding stuff. So uh, why don't we go ahead and Garrick, if, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, then we'll kind of go around the table and uh, get introductions from the other two as well. Sure. Uh, my name is Garrick Weaver. Uh, I am the Human Resources Director uh, and former uh, bad mechanic. Uh, we have a company called uh, Pen Power Group. Uh, we are based in Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, as well as New York. Uh, we have two divisions. We have a standby generator division, uh, which does power and industrial. Uh, we're on, and in those cases, we're also on the West Coast as well. Uh, and then we also have our fleet services division, uh, which does traditional shop work, uh, does also emergency repair, and then we also are expanding very heavily into what they call mobile fleet, uh, where we're actually going on-site to clients uh, to perform the functions, uh, your, your PMs, uh, any other uh, work that can be done at the shop so that your trucks are not down. Uh, we do that pretty much whenever it's convenient for them. About two seven employees. Uh, so a few. You've, you've got a few irons in the fire here, right, Garrick? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the really cool parts, and I was talking to the guys about this before we went live on the webinar, uh, was that one of the really cool parts about what I feel like our, our part of the industry is, is bringing people from different backgrounds together. And so you heard Garrick with more of that trucking background. We got a couple others with automotive background, both from the dealer and independent side. It, it's really fun for me to be able to see all of the different talented people in our industry come together to talk about something like onboarding. And, and uh, that's where it's going to be really, really exciting for somebody like Garrick to join us. Now, John, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is John Flick uh, from Quiz Tire and Automotive Service Centers. Uh, we are located in Southeast Pennsylvania, greater Philadelphia area. Uh, we have three locations, uh, independent shops, um, we pretty much work on, you know, all car and light duty trucks, some diesel work, um, but there's pretty much nothing we won't do here. So we'll take it on. All right. And, uh, and John's been a good partner of ours for, for a few years now. So we appreciate you, uh, you joining us today, John. Uh, Chad, how about you? Uh, my name is Chad Nichols. I'm from um, uh, Broadway Automotive, um, Green Bay, Wisconsin. We, um, under the Broadway umbrella, we have Three different stores we cover. Uh, my store, we have Chevrolet Volkswagen, but we also have Ford, Hyundai Genesis, um, GMC Cadillac. So um, under the umbrella, quite a few different brands. My store in particular, Chevrolet, Vol Chevrolet Volkswagen. Um, we have a full, uh, a full fleet department, so heavy duty truck shop. Um, under my department, we also have detail. So roughly, I have about 40, 42 technicians and my entire direct reports, about 100 people that report directly to me. So um, big store. A lot of volume and we move pretty quick. We got a couple of East Coast guys, a couple of Wisconsin guys here. It just, uh, it's like Packers Eagles right now. We got this, uh, this dynamic. Nah, it, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, all right. So let's, let's get into it. Uh, onboarding in general uh, is a concern. We saw that with the stats that we got back from our Wrenchway Insiders. It's one of the big reasons why 
we wanted to have this conversation today. And we want this to be kind of an open and candid conversation, right? We wanna talk about the our shortcomings as an industry, but also talk about some of the stuff that we do well. And I think the three of you are very well versed in this. And and uh, I, I'll start by opening this to, to the group and whoever takes it first, uh, you can run with it. But I wanna talk about what goes wrong with the typical onboarding process. What is it that, uh, what is the reason why maybe technicians and not just technicians, I think this goes for everybody as a whole, right? Why is our onboarding process so bad in so many ways? Uh, you know, I think it, it's, I've seen it from my end on the employee side. I think at times, even for us as an employer, we struggle with it. And I think it's something that we just have to shine a light on to, to make it better. Uh, so I, I, I want to ask that, where, where have we gone wrong with onboarding in the past? And and Garrick, maybe I'll start with you. What any thoughts to to where we've gone wrong? Well, I think I think uh, I mean it's a great question, um, but it, it it contains a lot of pieces uh, because onboarding. A lot of people just consider that to be well when they get there, the day they get there. Um, in my in my opinion, onboarding starts at the moment that the individual accepts the position. What are the steps to get them on board uh, into the organization, pre-employment testing, all that? Um, but then also ordering their uniforms, making sure they have their locker, all that kind of stuff. But then I also believe that it is also tied into how we communicate with that person, both uh, before they start as well as after they start. You know, are we checking in with individuals? Uh, are we making sure everything's okay? Um, there's, a, there's an alarming statistic of the number of the people that don't come back after the second day, second or third day. And so I think onboarding goes bad when we don't actually, we think, okay, we filled the position, we can take down the help wanted sign, or we can take down the advertising, and we're good to go. We've got to sell that candidate until the minute they walk in that door and even beyond. Are we buying them lunch on the first day? Do we have a buddy for them? All those kinds of things I think we break down that we really think that it stops at the moment they sign that offer letter. Now, Garrick, do you think, is that something that's changed? And I, I see in the comments here, uh, from David Reckman, they, they experienced ghosting, failed drug, drug and background checks. We rarely have even gotten to an onboarding in the last six months. It does feel like something that we've started to feel more pain with in the last few years than what we had before. Is, is that just me or is that uh, something everybody's seeing? I, I'm, I'm absolutely saying that we're, we're, we're seeing the, the ghosting. Um, you know, we're seeing that turning it down the day before. Um, and I think just with technology is a blessing and a curse. You know, it, we, use it, we use it on the interview process to text people things back and forth. And then when they decide not to take the job, they text us back and we're upset. Well, we, we can't, we have to figure out a way to communicate with them, um, make it as simple as possible, but also have as much continuity. So on our team, we make sure that the, the talent acquisition person stays in touch with that person until they've taken the drug screen and then we pass it over to the HR person because if they have any questions about things, they've built that relationship with whoever is actually the one that they were speaking to. So just again, just my opinion. Chad, anything you'd want to add there? No, oh, Garrick makes a lot of really, really great points. I, I, I think the entire dynamic has changed as far as, you know, all the things we're talking about, the people we're sitting down with. But I think the communication aspect is one of the most important pieces of it. Um, it, it's developing that relationship right, right at from from the interview process day one. Um, being intentional, having the conversations about a lot of things we're talking about. Um, it's it's a employees market right now. They they have a million opportunities. Um, they're looking for that relationship and where is going to be the best place for me, in my opinion. But I also think the dynamic of our industry also is counterintuitive to to onboarding. It's um, and I can't speak for John or Garrick, but um, you know, at, at our store, it's, it's production based We're you know, we're, we're selling time. So, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, you know, you got the new guy in there, like Garrick said, have that buddy, have that somebody next to them to continue to develop, you know, that relationship aspect and that piece of it, as we're trying to get them ingrained into our culture and, and society here. So. Yeah. Do you think, do you think some of that comes from uh, being short staffed, like perpetually understaffed? And when I say that, we put so much pressure on a new person coming in because we are we're desperate to get them in and so as soon as they they get we get them we're like hey get out to the floor we need we need you out there as soon as we possibly can yeah i mean 100 percent. and you know i i'm speaking from experience on this i i you know about two years ago i brought a young man in and 
and and I think you know I think he oversold himself a little bit, and that happens. You know, you're yeah. you're, you're going to see the best version of him when you're in that interview. But um, out of the gate, I think I expected too much out of him and put him in a situation where he was bound to fail. So it was a good learning experience. Ultimately, he didn't spend a lot of time with our organization, which which is sad. But um, you know, it's it's those those are things you have to talk about and learn from. I mean, if you're if you're not identifying the issues of why people are leaving, then then you're a step behind. Yeah, and I, ASC, this is a, a stat that we refer to a lot, but uh, 41%, uh, roughly 41% of technicians specifically leave the industry in the first couple of years they're in the in the business. And I think there's a lot of that, right? I don't think that's just exclusive to you, Chad. I think it's it's a problem that we've got in our industry as a whole and, and something uh, that is important that we have that conversation around, a, a good candid conversation around because it's not going to change unless we we get all of our dirty laundry out there, right? We need to we need to kind of talk about it and have a, a kumbaya moment, moment so we can uh, can all chat about it. But uh, John, I mean, how is your experience with it? I mean, are you seeing some of the same stuff that these guys are? Yeah, just reading the comments here, uh, I have the same problems. I mean, just getting these guys to show up for the interview is a challenge within itself. And then it's almost like the tables have turned. They're interviewing us now. There's so many options out there. I mean, you can go in pretty much any shop and get hired. So you really got to put your best foot forward when you do get them in the door. Um, and when they do come on board, uh, we always try to make uh, the team around him know, like, hey, guys, listen, this guy's coming on board. Let's try and make it as smooth as possible. Help him out as much as you can because he's going to make everybody else's life easier. So we try to get everybody to pull the, the rope in the same direction. And then hopefully it's a smooth transition. And then we always follow up with the tech, you know, a week or two after the first day, just to see how everything's going. How, how has it changed in your experience, John? You've been in it for a while now. Like what, it, it's had to have changed, like you've done like a straight up 180 uh, with um, when it comes to onboarding and the importance of onboarding. I don't think in the past we probably gave much thought to it other than like just get them in and get them rolling. But uh, has it kind of forced your hand a little bit to have to look at it differently? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been times where we've interviewed a technician and then we follow up a couple days later and they tell us, you know, ah, I just accepted a job already. And it seems like they accepted that job on the spot. So what we've been trying to do lately is at that first interview, try to get the deal done right then and there. It's very hard, but usually you don't want to let them go out the door because, you know, there's other interviews that they have lined up if, if they're worth, you know, their while. So one of, one of the things just tied exactly in what you just said is we, um, we just pulled in our VP of sales to create what we call a closing training, uh, which is helping our recruiters to close that deal. Under, overcome that objection. What is it? Oh, well, I need to, um, I have another job interview. Okay, well, what is it about this job? Well, I want to see about the, the money. And again, it's it's these questions. You don't want to necessarily make people feel like they're under pressure, but you want to try to overcome those objections because mm -hmm. right, the minute they walk out the door, um, you know, then all of a sudden they're, you know, they're thinking about it or, uh, or the like. So I, I think that I'm glad to see that organizations are thinking the same way we are. Um, as long as you aren't competing with us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, that's it, it's refreshing to see that that we're not just the ones thinking it's just us. So yeah, Derek, we're in this and we're in the same boat. Um, my my entire list of interview questions has completely changed in the last year of of what I ask um, potential candidates. Um, you need to be ready to to make to make that to make that call at the end of the interview and have that conversation with them. You know, just talking about what other options are out there for them, too. Uh, it's, a, it's a great point. How does that, Chad, I mean, does that put some level of discomfort on your end from the management side where you know you've got to pull the trigger fast? Or it, And the reason I ask that is I think when we talk about getting people on, oftentimes we're, we're so focused on getting people on that maybe we turn our turn our like we turn our attention to filling the the bot, filling the open position with a warm body mm -hmm. rather than trying to build our cultures. Do, do you think that it puts more pressure on a manager to, to have to pull the trigger? I'm very, very fortunate that our organization has a phenomenal um, human resources team. Our recruiters, 
um, they put very, very good candidates in front of us. So, um, you know, and I, if I don't think I had that filter up front, yes, it, it definitely would. But uh, many of the people that sit down with our, our, you know, our culture, our people, the people that we're looking for, they go through a pretty rigorous process of making sure that we have a, a highly viable candidate in front of us. So, um, you know, I mean, there's always the ones that squeak through, but I'd, I'd say a good 89% of the time, everyone I'm sitting down with, I'm more than comfortable making that, you know, making that call on the spot. And obviously too, I mean, it, it's not just my call. It's going to be whoever, the other manager that's in there with me. We have a great support staff here too. So shop foreman, you know, assistant manager, whoever's going to be with me at that point in time. But um, I, I think, um, I think it all starts at a very, you know, way before they get to me, it starts, it starts at a much deeper level. How, one thing I want to touch on before we move forward is, uh, onboarding process in general. Do do all of you have an onboarding process that's laid out, or does it change from person to person? Is it the same thing? Like every single person is going to go through this exact same onboarding process? I'd open that up to the group to to anybody that wanted to talk about that. I think. So. Go ahead. It, it's pretty. Uh... Uh, like cut and dry for us. Usually everybody goes through the same process. Um, but I mean, if, if there's something that needs to be different, we're, we're definitely, you know, open for that. So whatever needs to be done, we'll, we'll pretty much do it, especially at this point. And what, is there a piece of training that's in there? Uh, like, so uh, if, if we're walking through an onboarding process and it goes from the time that, you know, we're going through the interview process and then we go, and we're, we're, uh, we offer them the job, Does the, is that where the onboarding process starts? So we've put an offer out to you now, now our communication strategy is going to, to really uh, engage. Uh, walk me through that piece, the, the process in general. What is it that you feel like is important as far as a, an onboarding process goes and when should it start? Garrick, maybe I'll, I'll call on you, Garrick, because I know we've talked about this in the past. Uh, when when do you feel like that onboarding process starts and really how do you start to deploy that process? Yeah, and sorry, I've got two screens. So if I'm not looking at you, I'm actually looking at you. <laughs> um, So for us, the onboarding starts uh, when the person has accepted the offer letter. Um, we are doing some things a little bit um, earlier in the process. We're sending them the, the benefit guide and some different things so that they're truly seeing the big picture earlier in the process. But when they're made an offer, um, they're given their offer letter, they're given their uh, benefits overview again, and then if they are in one of our union locations, we do give them a copy of the contract because we feel it's important that they know what that contract entails. They're gonna be part of that. Um, but then the, the onboarding really from there is, uh, once we have that signed offer letter, the background check starts right away. Uh, then we do the drug screen. Um, and then you know it, it, there's definitely some handholding um, along the way. Um, I will say that um, there are, uh, it gets to be frustrating and that's where we have some of that handoff um, is at the drug screen level because a lot of times we actually have to physically talk to them um, because if they have to do a, an exam, a health exam, um, they have to be able to go to certain places. So that's where I think our onboarding can sometimes break down is that the technicians realize that, okay, now I've got to actually do the work. I've got to go, I've got to take some time off for a drug screen. We try to be helpful, but again, if they've got to do an exam or something like that, a lot of times they start to get a little bit leery and say, hey, I think I'm going to stay where I am. Yeah, if the, if the pain of taking the job exceeds the pain of leaving the, their current job, it makes it, it makes it a lot tougher on that person. Now, uh, Chad, I, I'm curious, how do you see it from the standpoint of the HR's role in this? to a manager's role in this, so like a service manager's role in this. I, because I, I feel like there's times, even when I was on the service management side, it felt like I, I almost felt uncomfortable, right? Because, and it wasn't because I didn't trust the HR department. It was because I, there were some of the things where I, I just didn't know where they were at in terms of progress or where they were at. Do, do you see anything like that? I hope they're on this call because I'm, I'm gushing about them, but no, I, I don't. <laughs> um, um, they, they really do a phenomenal job with, with the support end of it. And, you know, a lot of, I'm reading some of the comments here on the side too. And, and, you know, 
the onboarding piece is such a big key to it, but, you know, just getting those people, and I, th I saw somebody put this in here, um, strongly built around, um, the onboarding process that is strongly built around culture. And, you know, when we're looking, I know at our HR team, we're looking for a specific type of individual, um, you know, as far as from like a culture standpoint, we want to make sure that they mesh well, but um, great point by, by um, you know, what you, I think what you just said with, if the pain of leaving is greater than coming in, you know, technicians by nature are a little capricious sometimes. So um, it, it, it's it's difficult, right? We're 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 trying to to really make them make a big change, and uh, you know we're in the middle of a move right now. We're moving technicians into a new building, building, and it's been, um, pardon my French, but a hellish week. Um, it's been really difficult and a lot of frustration. They don't want to change. So, um, but you know, a, a big piece of it is too. And I think Garrick was kind of talking about this. You know, I, I always kind of attribute onboarding to like your first day in a new gym. You walk in, you you don't know where anything's at. Everybody's wearing headphones. Nobody's paying attention to you. You don't know where the locker room's at. And you're kind of just lost, right? You don't know where to find anything. So, um, you know, our process is, it, it, we change it based on the individual and, you know, what the situation's like. You know, if I have an NWT, uh, our, our college grads coming out, we put them on a completely different program than we would somebody that just, you know, a walk in off the street. But, um, you know, it's being very, very intentional with individualizing that too, because it, you can't broad stroke it. It's going to be different for every single person that's going to come through your door. And I think that's important, right? Because we're, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about people and culture and things like that. And those are all so intrinsically, you know, mixed that we need to we take all that into account when we're going through these things. I'm using lots of the ten dollar words, so I apologize. No, I no, I, I think it's such a great point though, because uh, oftentimes I feel like we use the same onboarding process for a twenty year vet that we do for a new college grad. And uh, I actually did one of our Wrenchway Buzz videos on that this morning that'll get released to, uh, uh, to tomorrow. And to me, those young people, it's so important to build confidence in them, right? Because th this is intimidating stuff. Like regardless of who's on this call or on this webinar, when you go into a shop, and I love the, the analogy you use of the gym because it is that way. You feel like a fish out of water and it's awkward and it's not not the most fun thing in the world. And uh, I, 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 I applaud you for applying a different strategy for younger people because I do think that is desperately needed in our industry to really try to find th that that happy medium between having to get them in and having them produce immediately to actually just you know having a good foundation of training and a good foundation of getting comfortable with you because a lot of times we'll throw a 21 year old into a bay and say all right good luck and and hope for the best right like am i am i off base there no no not at all no and i and think that oh go ahead gary I was going to say, I think, you know, to the point that was made before, you know, there are there are so many things that are part of onboarding and it's beyond just the paperwork. It's beyond just the, the basic stuff. The challenge is, is that, and, and I would argue that I think a lot of people do not do it the right way. And so it's, you know, they, they say, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Whatever you do, do it consistently. You know, the consistent thing is, Check it in with the person two or three days beforehand. Do you need anything? Is your toolbox being delivered? Anything, anything like that. And then make sure that first day with the lunch and, and all that other kind of stuff, walk them around, you know, have the, you know, have the team members, you know, kind of spend some time with them and whatever, but also acknowledge, sit them down, you know, every day for the first week and kind of check in with them because that is part of the culture that people want to get to, but I think sometimes, and this is a knock on my own profession, but sometimes HR people like to get so lofty about what they want to do and make everything perfect, that this is just nuts and bolts. Will, if this were you, would you feel comfortable on day one? When you go home on that first week, is your family saying to you, are you happy you made this decision? Because I will tell you right now, if the family isn't happy, that person isn't going to stay. It's just, it, it's the way. And if we we focus so much on, you know, and believe me, um, sitting behind me right now are 25 Pen Wow fundamentals. Believe in all of them. Um, but at the end of the day, it's Mazo's hierarchy of needs. Are they getting paid? Is their paycheck right? Are they happy where they're working? Um, did they get what they were promised? Um, and do they feel a part of the team? Um, I think that's really, really critical. 
Um, and, and I have at, at Penn, we've had to address where some of the more uh, experienced technicians are frustrated with some of these folks that come right out of a school. And we're like, well, okay, here's the thing. You're gonna retire in 10 years. This person's gonna be here. You gotta help them out. And once you kind of change that mindset of, I need you to help mentor them, most of the time, people will say, okay. Other times you'll have somebody that says, hey man, I was hired as a mechanic, now there's a mentor. <laughs> hey, that's fine too. We need we need everybody. So you, you were joking before we got on about getting on a soapbox, and my soapbox is keep it simple. So I, I love, love that. that. Yeah, great that's, points, Garrick. That's that's very non HR of you, Garrick. I, mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bad mechanic, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, I want to ask you kind of the same thing. What, what do you, uh, is there anything that you do uh, to make somebody more comfortable and maybe more so off of the, the, the paperwork stuff, right? But more of the just making somebody feel welcome when they come into your shop. Sure. Uh, well, when somebody first says they're going to take the position, we make it clear to them, don't screw over your, your current employer. If you need a month, take a month. You know, we don't want it done to us. We don't want to do it to anybody else. So we kind of think that, you know, opens the door that we are, you know, trust, trustworthy people. Second, uh, we always pay to have the tools moved. So, um, you know, let us Mark. know when your last day is going to be. We'll send the tow truck. You let us know what time and it'll be there. It'll get here safe. We'll wait for you or whatever needs to be done. We'll get you all settled in. Um, okay. And then on their first day, either my Myself or my dad will try and be there, uh, whichever location it is, to welcome them. Um, and then the Friday uh, of after their first week, we'll you know just say uh, it's their lunch is dedicated to them. We pay for it wherever they want to go. Um, and throughout that whole first week, uh, we'll have a technician assigned to them. Um, all our guys are salary, so it doesn't matter if you know their production is getting slowed down. Um, so that way this guy can get comfortable, um, show him how, where to road test vehicles, show him around the shop. And, you know, we tell him if you're not comfortable with doing anything, just stop and let us know. And we'll, you know, we'll change gears and until you get comfortable, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take over from there. I love that. Uh, there were a few things that you said there that really stuck out to me uh, that I just absolutely love. The, the lunch that's dedicated to them or the, the, the meal that's dedicated to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps maybe, you know, just breaking bread can help you just get more comfortable with people and start to learn their personalities. I think that's brilliant. I think paying for them, their toolbox to come over is, is a huge deal because that is a pain point for them, right? It, it yeah. sucks to move a toolbox. It is not fun. And especially if they're a good tech that's been around for a while, those tools, I mean, their 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 boxes are are uh, city blocks in a lot of cases. They're they're huge. So, yeah, uh, I, I think you laying out those things are building trust and and making it just more comfortable for them, right? That that it's making it less of a pain point for them to want to come to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And and Chad, I don't. I'm curious if if you took anything from that, or if you have anything to add to that. No, I mean, we do a lot of the same things. And actually, you know, as I'm listening to John there, I was reading some of the comments on the side and um, Jeff Daniel said on, your mentor shouldn't lose a dime to help train a new tech. Um, I agree, it is on management. And we actually have a program here. And so I want to touch on that where um, when I have a, a new, and I'm, I guess I'm going to go with our, our, our college grads, the young guys, right? Um, it's a generation people seem to struggle with. But um, we bring those guys out and we put them on a mentorship program. And, and I... And I I can't speak to everybody on this call, but we all have guys in our shop that are the shot callers, right? Um, there's maybe two, three, four of them. Um, some of them are, are difficult to deal with, but some of those guys, you just got to get on that level with them. And I, I think maybe, maybe it's Garrick or John that talked about this, but, um, you know, it's having that conversation, right? You're part of our culture. You're part of where we're going and what we do. And I want to instill, you know, your knowledge. It was Garrick. Sorry, that was you. Um, you know, I want you to be a part of, of the next generation of their development. So we'll put those those younger guys with these guys for anywhere from six to 18 months. And um, what we do is we we actually, we exhaust our wage with the mentor. The mentor doesn't pay a dime for it. But if they get to the point where the technician actually is starting to uh, actually produce more than their wages, the, the mentor actually keeps all that extra. So um, it's a way where there's some skin in the game for him too. But 
I mean, real, really the money, money part of it aside, we're really looking at developing that relationship and showing them how we do things in our shop. You know, um, how do we, how do you play in the sandbox for lack of a better way to say it? So, um, you know, I think there's really intentional ways that we can do that. And like John said, it's, it's gotta, they have to be, they have to be inclusive. It's gotta be, they've gotta feel like this is the right spot because um, you know, Gary said this earlier too, the family aspect of it is huge. It's gotta be good for their family and everybody comes in at a different level. And, you know, it, it, that was a great point earlier, Garrick. So I just want to give you credit on that one, but. Well, and, and I typically wouldn't, uh, I'd table the questions until a little bit later, but I, there's one that I've seen a few times on here that I think maybe we should address, which is uh, Shane Wilker had put a question in, how do dealers handle drug testing in states with legalized marijuana? And I wouldn't even just specify legalized marijuana. We can talk about that. But I, I think that it's a big concern to a lot of people, right? Because it's, a, it's another road bump in the process. It's something that could derail somebody from coming to work for us. And yet you still want to make sure they're coming and they're being safe when they're at work. So it's almost like this internal conflict, I feel like, for a manager where you're, you're trying to uh, live by the letter of the law, but at the same time, you're probably desperate for people, right? And so how, how do you go about that? And any advice for uh, maybe if, if it is legalized marijuana uh, or if, it, if maybe even not, like the drug testing in general, when that's a piece of your onboarding process, uh, how do you uh, how do you kind of work that part? Uh, and, and how much of a concern is that to the three of you? I can start it off. If you want me to, John? You look like yeah, you're ready. Go. you want to go. Ah, uh, no, you can start. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I saw that one too, and I and I and I was wondering if we were going to touch on that or not. Um, uh, at Broadway, we wrote, recently had changed our our policy on that. So I, I guess I'll preface that. I can't make a formal job offer until I have a clear drug and background screen. So um, we don't we don't test for marijuana. Um, that's not a that's not a um, what's the word I'm looking for a deal breaker. Um, so I, I have that conversation real kind of lightly, I guess. You know, at the end of the conversation, hey, I can't I can't have I can't make a formal offer until these two things are cleared. Is that an issue? I'm I'm looking for body language at that point. You know. Um, at, in that moment in time, I can pretty much tell if that's going to be an issue or not, or if there's more to the story or that. But uh, again, I'm fortunate that most of the people that I, that come for, uh, across from me at my desk, I I really don't uh, you know have too many issues with that. So, um, but you know, it's a great question. I know there's a, a lot of states out there that you know a lot of people are doing it, but I, I mean, we don't have an issue with it at work either. So I can't speak for everybody here, but that's kind of my, my process. What we do here, John. Uh, well, we don't drug test, so you don't have to worry about that if, if you come here. But, I mean, we have had some problems with, you know, a couple guys, you know, either drinking or coming to work drunk. And zero tolerance for that. You can't be operating a vehicle, let alone inspecting a vehicle, under the influence. So, um, you know, with us, we don't really have an HR department or anything like that. So it's just kind of one and done, you're out. So. But as for drug testing, we don't we don't do that. It's scary though, right? Because I, when when somebody comes in and if you're using a hoist and you're under the influence and and don't set up the hoist properly and that car falls on somebody or whatever it is, that's that's the stuff that kept me up at night. Like I I, I know when I was running shops, that was something that was terrifying because somebody could get seriously hurt or killed, and it's um. You know, it's a hard enough job as it is, but then you throw, you know, the influence on top of it, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that's terrifying. Yeah. I think for, for us, so we, on our power side uh, that works on the generators, we are a government contractor. Uh, and I've been a government contractor in the past. So our requirements, you know, you got to be very careful about, you know, you go to work for an organization. You want to check those certain things because putting personal feelings aside, about about COVID, I mean, I'm sorry about uh, drug testing. Um, you you have to be careful because the company doesn't really have any control. So in our in our world, um, we work on we work on equipment that may be uh, government related, and when we do that, we we have to we have to drug test. Now in the so we drug test um, everybody in the organization. Now we are in the city of Philadelphia. 
Um, and in the city of Philadelphia, you can't test for marijuana with exception of some things which were under that exception. But we're also right over the border in uh, New Jersey. We have people who both live there and work there. Uh, so the way we approach that is it's just, and in New York, we're in New York as well, uh, it's just like alcohol. Um, if you, you know, if there's recreational use allowed or, or medical uh, use allowed, uh, you can't be under the influence of, of alcohol at work, can't be under the influence of drugs at work. And drugs could be everything from prescription medication all the way through to, um, to weed. So, you know, we have not had a problem. We have had some individuals that um, need to do DOT road tests. We said, well, you're not going to be able to get a DOT uh, physical, but that's not going to prevent you from driving for us um, in terms of non-DOT vehicles. Um, you know, if it's a DOT vehicle, hey, you can't do the test drive. It's just, it is what it is. Um, but I think that, that we still pre feel pretty comfortable with our drug testing policy, but we absolutely um, will open it up and make sure that we're not treating somebody unfairly uh, based upon, you know, their, their decision uh, and their legal decision, uh, legal right to be able to smoke marijuana. Yeah, and I, th I think you hit on that really nicely, Garrick. And one of the things I would say is, regardless of what your policy is, make sure that you 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 have it stated, right? Because I think a lot of times, and I, I noticed this when we were more on the recruiting side of the business, where uh, there would be a tech that loved the shop and the shop loved the tech and they everybody was happy. And then the uh, the shop manager would say, okay, just uh, get this drug test taken care of and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And then that was the last time they heard from them. Right. So it, it, it came up too late in the process to where you wasted both parties' times. Uh, so if, if you can just be clear up front, I think that helps a lot. And I, I, that goes for anything in the onboarding process, right? And having a map or a roadmap of what they're going to go through from you know, the time that they accept the offer to the time that they're in your shop and, and maybe what's going to happen over the first week or month or whatever it is, uh, being able to outline what that is so that they have some understanding, hey, when you come in this first day, there's going to be some paperwork that you have to do. And then there's going to be some training that you have to do. I think having, having an outline and just kind of being able to break it down to almost like a common sense level to where this is this is what your schedule is going to be over that that first week or you know however long it is uh is that accurate guys i mean is that something that you you think is important in the onboarding process so important jay very important nobody loves paperwork <laughs> nobody nobody at all hey but i what i wanted to say was you know going back to john's point and all kidding aside you know john that is a that's a selling point you know for organizations if you don't drug test or if you don't background check you know, um, organizations, because we all believe in, you know, we work a lot of times with second chances up to a point. The challenge with us is that we have, we have mobile technicians that are driving out in vehicles that are, you know, with $80,000 worth of equipment in it. We have to be very careful. But if you're an organization um, that has any of those things, whether it be drug testing, whether it be background check, whatever it is, that it, I would absolutely um, talk about that during your interview process. Um, but going back to the, you know, the original point, yeah, laying out for people and letting them know that I always start out the HR stuff by saying, this is the most boring, you know, half an hour, hour of your time that you're going to have at, at Penn. Because um, that is reality, that they've got to sign your name eight, eight different times. So, um, you know, I, I, I equated to a, uh, kind of signing a mortgage for a house. You know, you got to sign all the paperwork. Uh, and we try to get that, that training out of the way as quickly as we can so that they can be turning wrenches, uh, which is what they want to do. 100%. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Before we get to those, one of the things I want to ask you guys is, how do you know if you've got a good onboarding program or not? How do you know if it's effective or how, do you, how can you tell that maybe, uh, hey, we've got some things we need to tweak, we need to improve this a little bit? I think there's probably some obvious answers to this, but wondering if there's maybe some less obvious things or cues that you could look for to see where you're at in terms of onboarding. Is it just simply knowing that, hey, we've got a pretty good onboarding process and it seems to work? Or are there is it is it deeper than that? Like is it something where you can micro analyze it and be able to pick up pick apart pieces and and try to improve them? You know, I, again, one of our big mottos is promote and improve. How do you look at your onboarding process and identify areas that, 
that might need improvement. Uh, and Chad, maybe I'll start with you. I don't know if, if uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it, it, oh. it is kind of a vague question. It, it's a good question, though, and, and I and I think that my answer it would be uh, like there'll be a lot of levels to it. Um, I think if you ever get to the point where you think that you've arrived, I think that you that's the part where you need to start breaking it back down. Um, you know, I think you need to be extremely intentional about asking the people that have maybe went through it and getting getting really positive feedback or not positive feedback, but very feedback. specific feedback, like. You know, hey, don't sugarcoat it. I want to know where did we go right, where did we go wrong, and um, I guess what pops into my head is, you know, just with the amount of uh, of curveballs that we've all experienced in our industry over the last couple of years, regardless of dealership independent or anything else, um, we have to be constantly adapting and evolving. And I, I think that's been the common theme through everything I've seen, not only in our conversation but the but the comments in the side too. So um, if you either grow or you go, right? So constantly be evolving with the people that we're trying to attract you know I, I, so many people i see on your we can't even get somebody in here to talk to them so i mean you know there's it's not just about onboarding it's a big onion um you know i i i feel that right i always want the smoke i want i want you to tell me all the bad stuff so i i'm always gonna you know talk with my technicians and maybe some of the younger guys hey where did i mess up where did i go right um what could i do better it's not just about the you know what I think it should be, because I'm going to go off my own biases. I want to know what they think it should be. So being intentional with the people that you are surrounded with and getting really good feedback too. Well, and the fact that you're open to feedback, it says a lot about you, right? And I think that says a lot about managers in general, because I, I do think it's easy to, to run and hide from that feedback, right? But that's the stuff that's going to help you identify that is when you when you hear from a new person and like, hey, I would have done this differently. And if you can you can really take that back and implement it into your program, assuming that it's good advice. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard to put yourself in their shoes and see it from a different lens when you're, you know, doing it over and over and over again. So getting different perspectives on it, I think is is a really good practice. John, I don't know if, if uh, maybe you have any insight into, you know, how you how you can tell if you've got a good or, or maybe not so great uh, onboarding process. Um, that's, uh, yeah, like, uh, Chad was saying, it's, it's a very good question. Um, there have been times where uh, technicians left and I am thinking to myself, like, oh, he's definitely interested. He's, um, I bet the house he's coming on board and then they don't. And it makes you wonder why, like, yeah, like, where did I go wrong? So it's usually me and my dad that's doing the interviewing. Um, and the last couple of times we've tried different techniques when, like I said before, just laying it all out, out on the table and try and get the deal done right then and there. Um, and this last time it worked, thankfully. Um, so yeah, I think you, it all depends on the candidate too, what they're looking for. Um, but yeah, there's always room for improvement. So if, it, if something's not working, you gotta change it up. And to what that is, I'm not sure right now, but uh, trying to get the deal done at the table is, is uh, one I would suggest. Well, the, the fact that you're looking at different things, right, or that you even tried a different approach in the first place, I think, again, says a lot about you as a manager and in something that I feel like that's changed about our industry a little bit here in the last few years is that maybe we're not so rigid in that. And, and there were a lot of cases where, you know, and maybe I was even guilty of this is like, this is our process that we're going to follow this process and, and really maybe not poke holes in it. But that's a detriment to to you and to your growth as a company is if you're just stuck in your ways and you're not going to adapt because uh, that's the way you've always done business. I mean, that's a that's that's not a good way to grow and that's not a good way to get better. So uh, yeah. I do think that that's really good advice. Garrick, uh, anything to add there? I think he's muted. Yeah, sorry about that. No, I, I was going to say, I think, I think the nail is hit right on top of the head on that. Yeah, yeah. And my, my headphones just died like midway through. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I do think that's that's great. So we've talked about just identifying if uh, we've got gaps in our processes. Uh, when you look at the long-term effects of onboarding, do you see that impact five years down the road from a, a good onboarding process? I mean, is it something where there's more than just that first month 
that you see the results. Uh, and the reason I ask this question is I've been a part of that on the negative side, right? Where I was an employee, I could tell within the first like hour that I was at this company that I wasn't going to like being there. And it was just the way that the tone was set throughout uh, that it just, it, it could have just been a met, like maybe a, uh, our personalities not meshing or something not connecting, but you could tell right away. Uh, do you see anything familiar or, or something like that where uh, you can see the effects of a good onboarding five years down the road? Garrick, I, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. I mean, are there long-term impacts of, of having a good on, onboarding process? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that if you, if you build it the right way, um, that individuals are going to want to be there. Um, they're going to want to be a part of the process. Um, and, and again, I think it's involving them in building the process. So to, to John's, to John's point, I love the fact that he and his dad are trying things. Um, but I would also, I would target, you know, one or two technicians at each location and make them your, uh, I call them interview champions. We haven't done it yet at our company. We're talking through it, but these people would basically be responsible for, you know, grab a soda with the, with the technician, walk them away, talk to them about the ins and outs of the organization, um, and that you're not asking them to sugarcoat it. You're not asking them to do anything. You're just asking them to be honest with that person. Um, but then we give, um, you know, my plan is to give them like a $25 gift card um, if that person accepts. Um, because more often than not, when they have those conversations with that technician, they're exchanging cell phone numbers and the guy's calling and, you know, you got to worry about what you're offering the guy in terms of pay. You got bigger issues, but he calls and says, hey, how are the benefits? Oh, they're pretty good. Um, you know, and so those kinds of follow up calls, um, I think that that kind of stuff, all of a sudden that builds that relationship. But if you have a, if you have somebody who is not meshing with that team, um, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to have a five-year conversation. It's going to be a five-month conversation. So, because they, you know, as some of the in my previous life, a couple of the uh, folks would say, "We eat our young." It's union members, and they were like, "Look, if they just don't, they don't fit. We're going to get rid of them on our own." Um, obviously, in our world, if we see somebody's not fitting, we're trying to work with them, trying to see what we can do um, to try to make sure that person fits. And if they don't, you just got to make the tough decision that their technical skills might be there, but if they aren't matching, matching with your team. You don't want to lose the rest of your team by keeping that one person. By the way, that's how you know you have a great culture too. If if you've got that really good culture and somebody doesn't fit into that culture and it becomes immediately obvious, regardless of their technical skill, uh, you know you've got a good culture and you've got a good group of people working for you. Uh, and I think sometimes that's frowned upon, but I always looked at it like, you know what? These people like working together and they're not going to let somebody else in here that's not going to jive with the rest of the team. And when you let those people in that might not jive, that's the, <laughs> I think Chad, you said it, that they're their best self on that interview. And if they're not even jiving at the interview process and you've got that interview champion, which I love that idea, Garrick, uh, that's, idea. it's not going to get better from there. Right. Right. Yeah. And, that, and by the way, my, in, in a place where I worked and when I, uh, I worked in aviation um, and I worked part-time in the paint shop, but my first interview was the receptionist. So if the person treated that receptionist poorly, um, then they, they, had a, they had a strike against them. And I was hiring pilots to fly helicopters. And if they came in and treated that receptionist like she wasn't, you know, she wasn't a human being, that's what they're going to do every day. And that's just, that's important, I think. So from that perspective, when you're interviewing, I know we're talking about onboarding, but even that first day, if you walk in and people don't know that John Smith is supposed to start, that's not going to go over well. A welcome sign on the door, if you can. I don't care if you print it out. Um, I think it's it's a great thing. So, I had read somewhere. Um, I can't recall where I got this from, but uh, there was actually a, a hiring manager that used to take his people to lunch and would pay the the server on the side to screw up their order. Uh, to see how they reacted. <laughs> so yeah, when you tell that story, Garrick, I, that uh, that reminds me of uh, when I had read that. So I, I I do think it's just trying to to dive in and see what their character is in general uh, through the onboarding process. But uh, it really really good advice there. Now we are we're about ten ten minutes left in uh, the webinar here, 
And so I want to touch on a few different things before we before we close up shop here, and we will get to the questions uh, at the end here. So if you do have a question, make sure you get it into the Q and A. Uh, but what are some things that our listeners can take home? What are some things that that you know that, that as we've talked about this, it's such an in depth uh, uh, topic, right? We could talk about this all afternoon uh, in different, I guess, details of the onboarding process, but what are some suggestions or some advice you would give to those shop managers that are out there right now that might be struggling with this? What are some ways or opportunities that we can improve this? And uh, John, maybe I'll, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Um, well, we're all in the same boat, really. Um, we're all struggling for employees right now. Um, the labor shortage, the part shortage. Um, the only thing I can say is just, you know, stick to your guns and the pendulum will swing back. My dad always says like, it'll, it'll come back. You know, the tech school schools are full. So these kids are coming out and, and people follow the money. So we, this is a great industry to be in. Um, you know, the cars are getting more complicated and, you know, it's going to take a lot of talent to fix them. So um, people will follow the money and hopefully soon uh, the industry will be full of technicians. But uh, for right now, just, you know, buckle up and, you know, stay with it. Well, and I think that's that's the important side of the onboarding process, right? Is, is as hard as it is to find people right now, that's one thing that you can control is is your onboarding process and making sure that you've got your uh, you've got your ducks in a row so that, you know, it's, I, I, we, ca we talk about it in our company all the time, control what you can control. And that's one thing that you can have a really, really good grasp on. And I think it makes uh, getting people in and making them happy once they're there a lot easier if you have a good onboarding process. Chad, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, what keeps popping in my head is just transparency. Um, Garrick said a lot about this um, in his point that he made, but you know, if we're if we're sitting down with people and we're explaining, you know, what the job looks like and we're going through all this stuff, it's such a multi-layered thing, but it, their first day doesn't reflect everything that you just said, you know, then you need to take a good hard look at, at, at your organization or your shop or where you're at and, and, you know, make the changes. Like Garrick said, you know, if you got that guy that's that, that the nail that sticks out gets hammered, right? Um, you know, sometimes making the, the appropriate moves within your organization to, the, a lot of that stuff does follow with it. So, I mean, you know, be transparent with yourself, your employees, your organization, where am I at, where do we want to go? Um, I think that's a big part of it too. Yeah, looking in the mirror, right? And just yeah. kind of seeing, I, and that's one thing we say a lot at Wrenchway too, is that not there's no business that's perfect. Like there's nothing out there that's perfect. So being able to understand that and and really embrace that, I think helps you when it comes to fixing not only an onboarding process, but any process, m making sure you're looking at it through an honest lens and, uh, and not trying to, uh, not trying to maybe uh, soften the blow, like actually listen and, and make those changes. Cause I think that has a big, big impact on your business. Uh, Garrick, uh, any take homes for, for our fine folks listening here? Real quick is, is keep it simple. Whatever you're on onboarding until you build on it, just keep it simple. Um, and you know, Keep it consistent. And then lastly is, um, as part of any onboarding, there were some questions going back and forth about assessments and, and other things ahead of time and trainings and things like that. Um, would you want to do that? Would you want to do that? Would you have time for that ahead of time? If you don't, don't ask them to do it. Um, and then, you know, there's some legal reasons around assessments and things like that. But again, keep it simple. Uh, and then again, would you want to do it? That's great advice. Would you want to do it? And I think in a lot of cases, there's not a lot of the onboarding process that any of us would want to do. But I, I do think putting yourself in the other person's shoes and and really kind of going through the motions like they would does really help. And and uh, I think that that was really really good advice. So uh, if you guys don't mind sticking around here for just a second, we're uh, let, we've got some questions for the group. Uh, and uh, Jill Chitty says, "How are you getting buy-in from experienced uh, techs to be a mentor?" Most see the benefit, but it eats into their pay significantly if they are getting paid flat rate. Are you paying a differential for the hours they mentor or uh, really any insight there? So uh, anybody want to add to that or uh, answer uh, Jill's question there? 
I can grab that one. Um, at least at my shop, what we found, Jill, is is, is it actually doesn't eat into their pay at all. Um, they actually end up it actually ends up being a positive not only for the technician but the but the the individual as well. Um, you know, a lot of that does start with with setting the framework where that that doesn't just start with the mentor technician. You know, it starts with the service advisor, the work that's dispatched. It, it's it's a it's a big circle. So um, if you're giving the the you know the the newer technician or anybody that's coming in who hasn't been in the organization before the opportunity to um, to maybe start small and work his way up along with building that relationship with the guy next to him, you're kind of setting him up to fail. So um, what we've seen is probably about 90% of the of the technicians we bring in that put on that program, it actually ends up the the technician actually generates more income from that than losing it. That's great. That's great. Um, Tate Dumler says, does anybody have dedicated people who only work with onboarding? This is an interesting question because we, we are dealing with various size of, of companies. Uh, unless it's a gigantic company, I haven't seen that, but I'd be curious as to uh, uh, if you guys have seen any of that. That's a, that's a tougher one because that's uh, it, it, onboarding. Uh, I, I do see a comment from uh, Emily DeWitt, uh, we have an onboarding team, but it is not their only role. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I think too, is that everybody that's part of the onboarding process. So you have the people on the front end and then you have the people at the shop end. So you really should be on a regular basis sitting down with the shop team to make sure, hey, you have this technician coming in, his paperwork's done, you need this on the first day. So I think that's where people kind of wear those dual hats um, and you, you should be communicating so there's a smooth crossover from candidate to, to employee. Yeah, and I, Eric, you had hit on something earlier in this too, where when you've got that team member that's in the shop, that's actually a part of the onboarding process. One, I think they, they buy into it more, uh, but then th th you're gonna buy in with that new employee that comes in too, if, if they're accepted in the shop. I, I think we've all been a part of uh, teams where maybe that new person doesn't quite fit in or doesn't feel welcome. <laughs> And so being able to make them feel welcome uh, starts uh, with everybody on the team. So I, th I think that's some great, great points. Uh, my buddy, Jason Olinger, when does onboarding stop? That's a really good question. I don't know that I've ever answered that one. <laughs> does it ever stop? That's a great question. Yeah, very f uh, philosophical there, Jason. I, I, uh, I, I honestly don't know if I've got a good answer to that. I, uh, John, I, I don't know if you've got anything or I, I'll open this to anybody. Uh, I would say it never stops really because you, like uh, uh, Garrick and Chad were saying, you, you, you want to take everybody's opinion like throughout their career with the company, you know, if we want to get a new piece of equipment, like I want the technicians picking that equipment because they're, they're going to be the ones using it. So you know, just staying, uh, you know, in touch with your technicians and everybody uh, throughout their career, I would say, you know, that's part of the onboarding process because you want them to stay with your company. Yeah, and I think Jason said it earlier uh, in the comments too. I, I didn't get to see everybody's comments here, but uh, one of the things that he mentioned was the importance of an exit interview. And I do think those are extremely important to be able to understand what people liked and maybe what they didn't. And you can oftentimes get it in a more candid way at an exit interview than you could over the course of the time that they're employed there. So uh, always look at that as a good tool to be able to get that good feedback too. But everything from the onboarding to the exit interview, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, to really uh, be learning and, and trying to figure out how to do better in, in your business. Uh, Paige Reimer says, does anyone have a favorite resource for market analysis of salary and benefits? Uh, again, this is a uh, maybe not so much onboarding, but maybe more recruiting type of question. But I think this is an extremely important question because I, I think there's a variety of different things you can use, but uh, open this up to the group. Anybody have uh, any insight into how they get uh, some information on, on competitive salaries and benefits? Um, I, I'll jump in on that one. So a couple things, um, and I'm trying to put on my small business hat. I used to own a business, you know, Large organizations, um, if you have a benefit broker, uh, your benefit broker should be able to, you know, they're the ones that help you select your benefits for your staff. They should be able to provide that information for you. 
Um, chambers of Commerce in your local area are really good at that stuff because that's what they're there for. Um, the concern I have about some of these websites out there um, is that they are self-reporting. So employees can throw their own stuff in there. Glassdoor is one of them. Um, Robert Half, the staffing firm, um, does a lot of them, uh, does a lot of different salary surveys and you can sign up for it electronically. Um, they don't always hit the, the technical world. Um, one area that I would also look into is there are employer associations. Um, so there's one in, in the Philadelphia area called the Mid-Atlantic Employers Association. Uh, then there's one over on the West Coast called the California Employers Association. Uh, for a couple thousand dollars a year, you get an HR support um, for HR support person. They'll look at policies. They'll walk something through for you. Um, and uh, there's one uh, in the Philadelphia area called the Southeastern Pennsylvania Manufacturing Association. Um, all these organizations are out there to help support that stuff for you. Um, and then the other place you can always look is the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, it, with the federal government. You will have to look up information and have to decipher some of it. But just be careful with these salary.coms, pay factors, pay scale, uh, all these ones, they can, they can be skewed based upon individual data. Um, so when somebody comes and tells you the average technician is making $45 an hour, then you scroll it down and you help break it down and you show it it's 35, you still gotta be prepared that you might need to pay $35. So don't, yeah. don't think it's an all or none. Yeah, they're, they're nice to reference, but uh, I wouldn't live by any of them, I don't think. I, I saw, uh, I think Jill Chitty put uh, the NADA annual survey, uh, the market analysis. I think that's a really good resource. Uh, there are a, a number of different resources, even simply going out to some job ads as well. Uh, but I do think knowing and understanding your your market uh, is is good because you need that when you go into that recruiting uh, that recruiting space and and um, yeah I, I I think these are all really good questions. Now uh, we are up on our time. Uh, I want to take a minute here to just say thank you to the three of you. Uh, you brought incredible insight to everybody and. Again, it's one that we probably, a topic that we probably could have spent a day on. Uh, so I appreciate you guys just trying to summarize what you could. And uh, I think there was a lot of really good information here. So uh, thank you so much uh, to the three of you. I, I genuinely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Good luck, everybody.